Hello, Toastmasters. Hi. Hello. Hello, Toastmasters. Hello. Yes. Welcome back. I am Priya, your Toastmaster for this session. Next, we are going to have our favorite speaker, Roshal Rice, back to discuss the leadership skills that we can develop through Toastmasters. As you already know, Roshal Rice is a long time Toastmasters, 22 years to date. That's 22 years. She is a distinguished Toastmaster, which is the highest education award in the Toastmasters program, and also an accredited speaker that we all saw this morning, which is a highest designation from Toastmasters International for professional speaking. She has led her, ho uh, her home club, the New York City Home Club, and also Brayon Park Toastmasters Club as president continuing its president's distinguished status. Recently, she was also the co-counsel chair for the Toastmasters accredited speaker. I am excited to welcome back Rochelle. Rochelle Rice, just about leadership. Just about leadership, Rochelle Rice. The director of the dance company <coughs> pulled me from rehearsal. Come, come sit. I was new to the company in San Francisco. I had come from the East Coast. And as I sat there wondering what this was all about with the director of the company talking to me, she said, lose the weight or lose the part. Now, I had an upcoming solo in the piece. And I was wearing an orange unitard. All orange. She said, you know, if you lived in New York, you probably wouldn't have this job. I didn't know what to do. So I stopped eating. I kept rehearsing. And I kept the solo. As I came out on stage, almost every thread of trust within myself had been broken. And as the curtain came down, I realized that even though they had changed my unitard to blue, because why? Thinner. I wondered how I would ever find the trust within myself again. I'm here with you today to speak about jazzed about leadership. I anchor it on that experience. Because to me, that was a turning point of how I was going to go through my life and work through different situations and be able to stand with all of you today and say, yes, be jazzed about leadership. I'll come to the end of the story. But as we move into this, I also want to share with you how you can stay jazzed with leadership. I also want to present, see if you can hear me at a teaching moment of some of you who have asked about the opening, the body, and the conclusion. I'm going to give you a point, story, action, point, story, action, point, story, action. Okay? So as I'm speaking and telling you the stories, you'll be able to see if you can follow it and how you also can put together. Fair enough? And let's dance. <laughs> Oh, thanks for changing that up. One of the things that we always talk about or that I love to say is why? Why should we be jazzed about leadership? Most important, this rapidly changing world. I met with a friend last week and she said, I don't know. I don't know what to do with my business. I'm going here. I'm going there. I don't know what to do. And I said, Diane, do you think companies know what to do? What the company put in for first quarter is going to change probably second quarter. Would you agree? 
companies that predicted huge returns or profits in, in fourth quarter of 2023 are now saying, oh no, that didn't quite work. Mm -hmm. We are constantly moving and having to change. What we thought was going to be a linear direction is now like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and you better be ready to go. Decisive and flexible. Right? I mean, we had the pandemic, it hit and we went and we made things happen. What's next? I don't live with doom and gloom, but being decisive and this ability to be flexible, by the way, Jocelyn did flexible, her arabesque was lovely. You have got to be decisive and flexible. And that doesn't mean wishy-washy. Do you understand the difference of decisive and flexible, not wishy-washy, like, well, I don't know what we're gonna do. It's okay to say, I don't know yet but I'll get back to you. And then lastly, to lead with integrity. I used this word a bit last night and this morning as well. The integrity is so important right now that I hope today when I present to you that everything that comes out of my mouth matches my body and you understand that my whole being is committed to being here with you today. Some of you are still learning and you're speaking from here and then you do a body gesture. Your goal is to be fully embodied as you present your words. It's not how many words you say, but how you speak them, body and mind. When we talk about leadership, we talk a lot about the failures and the triumphs. Now, I had the privilege of being in the Bahamas this summer to be at the World, at the International Convention. And I was doing a, an interview with world champions. And for those of you that don't know, this is Mark Brown. We have next to him Verity Price. And the gentleman on the floor is Darren LaCroix. Now, I don't know if you can see. So let me tell you what happened. Toastmasters called me and said, would you, would you like to facilitate a conversation with world champs? What? <laughs> of course I do this. Oh my God. We had a conversation with TI. We talked to the four people who were supposed to be speaking. Now I said four people who were supposed to be speaking. Mm -hmm. Virgil was one of them. Ramona from Texas was the other. Mark Brown. And oh my gosh, right now I just drew a blank on who the fourth person was, but I'll come back on that one. The day before we start to get word that Virgil can't get here from Portugal, he's having flight issues. And Ramona can't get out of Houston to get over to the Bahamas. Suddenly, we're thinking, what now? Talk about decisive and flexible. Is this okay, Rochelle? What are we going to do? What do we do? What do we do? I said, hold on. I know Mark Brown. I know Verity. I know Darren. I'm going to pull them in. We put this together the night before. I said, okay, I need you to do this, 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 and this, and here's the questions, and how do we go, how, this is how this is going to go. <laughs> so here's what happened. Again, the night before, I had already prepared my questions for the other two people that were joining us. Darren's world champion speech, he does a body gesture that is fabulous, where he goes flat down, okay? If you haven't seen it, he's it's like, wham, right down on the stage. So I said, Darren, can you still fall on the floor? <laughs> I said, because I can't do triple pirouettes anymore. Can you fall? Rochelle, no problem. I can still fall on the floor. <laughs> He's sitting next to me, giggling like a little kid, right? Ready for this? this mo we only know this is moment's going to happen. I'm saying, it's okay, we got this. Finally, the time comes when I'm asking him to demonstrate body language, body gestures. Darren, show us this. Da 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 da, wham! And he starts talking with his mic on the floor and he says, Rochelle asked me if I could still fall on the floor, but she didn't ask me if I can get up. <laughs> it was, I lost it because it had to be the most beautiful time to be working on stage and to celebrate a triumph where it came out of the blue as far as I was concerned. And this group had come together very last minute. 
right? We had to be like, okay, make a decision, boom, 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 be flexible, we got this, okay, go get, Darren, can you do this? Yes, I can, and then wham, he <laughs> nailed it. And I laughed so hard. It was such a triumph for me and for all of us to come together and work like that because we took it to that level of, we've got this, we're professional. Whatever your role is, handle it with that level of professionalism. Don't freak out, they're looking at you, you got this. You may not have all the answers, and the most important thing you can do is say, I don't have the answer right now, but I'll get back to you. This to me was one of the most incredible moments to celebrate a triumph in Toastmasters. However, there are indeed moments when people fail, yes and yes? But letting us come together here in Toastmasters and giving us that space to not necessarily fail, but kind of, what do you say, fall forward, keep moving forward, these always fall forward to success. And while we may not have the ability to everyone speak well or use their body language well or be perfect on Zoom or whatever, this is our place to practice, as Jocelyn said. Practice, practice, practice. As a dancer, we were always in the studio practicing, getting ready for performances, right? So whatever that means for you, practice, whether it's the body language, the gestures, et cetera, just keep practicing. It's never that we're failing here. It's more that we continue to learn and to grow. So let me share with you three points. And again, see, as a, as a learning point, you can follow my, my format here. Number one, energize your, so this is jazzed about leadership. Energize, right? Keep your club energized with realistic goal setting. <clears throat> During my time as the president of Bryant Park Toastmasters, it was back in the day when we had paper and it charted out the path to become a distinguished club. Do any of you familiar with that paper thing that I'm talking about? Just checking. Okay, great. Okay. And once a quarter, I would stand up at the front of the room and hold that paper up and let the club members know how we were doing. The visual works really well. When the paper went away, yes, it's convenient that we're all on our computers, but we don't see it. <coughs> Your club has the dashboard. Are you all familiar with the dashboard? Yes. Charting the progress? This past week, we had our annual dinner, our, we do an annual awards dinner. And our VP of education worked together with a, with a, member, of our, of a member of our club who's been with us for a very long time, Penelope, she's online with us, and put together the history of everything that we have done in the last year, including the fact that we were chartered in 1975. Stephen, who was the VP of PR, excuse me, the VP of membership, did not know any of this information, nor did people who came to the awards ceremony know that this club had done this, 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 and this. When he stood up there and gave that speech about what we have done as a club and how incredible this is, not only was he inspired because he had no idea of all this information, but he inspired everybody else. So he took this piece of paper that we used to have and started to broad talk about it to people in the club. That's what's inspiring people. How do you help people continue to know how well your club is doing, how well your district is doing? In your jobs, do you not have quarterly reports? Where's the quarterly report for your club? How do they know what direction they're going to do to go? How often are you sharing that information with them? Are you in the background just taking it off? So I ask you, as a call to action, what are you doing to help energize your club and hit those realistic goals? Okay, sidebar. So did you hear the point? I told the story about Steven, and then here's the action for you. Did that make sense? Point story action? Those are some of you that are trying to figure, how do I put this all together? Okay. So let's just take a moment, stretch your arms up. Yeah. Stretch over to your right side. I'm your mirror. Stretch over to your, it's amazing how many of you are holding your breath. <laughs> stretch over to your right side. And stretch over to your left side. Good. 
bring your arms straight up, relax them on down, take them behind your chair, hold the back of your, sorry, hold the back of your chair, give a little stretch forward like you're on the bow of the Titanic. <laughs> Feel that stretch across the chest and release. Oh, look at you all. Nice work. Does that feel good? Yeah. How does your body feel? Awake. Awake, energized. What else? David? Where did he go? Released. Released. Okay, great. All right. That's something that just has to come into place every once in a while when you've been sitting there for more than 90 minutes. All right. Talk about celebrating the successes. This is Penelope, who again, I've mentioned is online, who's mentored me, pushed me across the finish line over and over and over again. Penelope just received the presidential citation this past summer. Yeah, right? How many of you are familiar with the presidential citation? <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. This is an incredible, incredible opportunity to highlight and showcase someone in your district by receiving a presidential citation. What has that person done in their club and in their district to make sure that people continue to rise up? One of the things that Toastmasters were so great about in terms of showcasing people, one of the things is we do have a lot of awards and we love to give awards, but sometimes we just don't know about them. This one was so exciting to be able to, to see Penelope up there to receive this that you have to always look at again, showcasing who are the people in your club, in your district, that deserve something like this. Thank you, Penelope. Showcasing the strengths of your team for peak performance. This afternoon, we're going to do, I'm going to do a bit of a breakout of, the, of team, tech, team building techniques. We talk about showcase the strengths of your team. We had this dinner, as I mentioned, this past Tuesday night in New York. And the president came in and he said to me, I'm so excited. And I said, why? He said, because this all came together. And I said, yes, because you showcased the strengths of your team. <coughs> what happened was the club said to Han, we do this once a year. We have this dinner once a year. We do it at a restaurant in New York. We've had hybrid for the last couple of years, but we do it at a restaurant in New York. We order the trophies. This is what it all is, et cetera, et cetera. So he, the president, begins to set about finding a restaurant in New York City. How easy is that? It takes a little bit of work. He's the president. His strength, he just created, and I, I hope I've got this all right because I am not a total techie. He has created a tool where we get an email that we click the link and it shows where I have to confirm that I will be speaking that week, let's say. And then the entire, everybody has to confirm their role. The entire document itself generates the agenda and sends it out on the morning of our meeting. I know. Why should Han be trying to find a restaurant when he has this whole tool and technology. Do you understand what I'm saying? And by the way, he'll share the tool if you want it. It's incredible. I, guess, I think he created through J chat GPT. But... So here's Han, and I'm looking at him a couple of weeks before the event, and he's trying to find a restaurant, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this is what I love to do. Penelope loves to find restaurants. I love to make a party. <coughs> Sit back, Han. We've got this. Penelope and I are on the phone working to make this, this party together, talking about locations. And she said, oh, we've got this. It's two weeks. We've got plenty of time. I said, we definitely have plenty of time. It was an incredible event, and that's why Han could come in and feel so excited. Because why? He showcased the strengths of the team. <clears throat> this is what I love to do. You don't have to find the restaurant. I could never ever make an agenda from ChatGPT. <laughs> when you showcase the strengths, you have peak performance. You have to find out what lights people up. What are you doing to highlight the strengths of your team? How are you showcasing their strengths? Anyone? Do you have someone you might be showcasing? 
Okay. Again, later this afternoon, I'll do a little bit on that when we break out into the team building and how do we showcase the strengths and then how do we make it all happen so that everything is working to a great, to, for clubs to thrive. So this is a great, this is a great example of this club. This is District 119, which is in the New York area. And District 119, they had a, believe it was a 97% retention rate last year. 97%, right? Yeah, I know. I know. And this is, this is Lisa on the end. She, that was, this is her district. And on the end is Raji. I don't know if you all know Raji. She's the incoming, she'll be the, she'll be the next Sorry, Penelope, second vice president, I think it is, but I apologize for that one. This group then is, gets to stand up there and really shine. This is how she wanted to showcase the talents and celebrate them. My favorite part was they all went through the whole thing. They have their T-shirts ready and everything and included the beautiful props of the Statue of Liberty. See, it's New York. We're here in the house. <laughs> this is how you can help showcase your team as well. If there is something that's coming up, make a deal out of it. See what people want to do. But again, I ask you, what are you doing to showcase your team? Okay, so sidebar. I did showcase. I told the story about Han. I brought it into what are you doing? Then I made a little mistake because I went to this slide, meaning I should have had this one up a little bit earlier. Full disclosure. <laughs> All right. And lastly, the connection. Make the connection. So as you know, I've been in Toastmasters since 2001. And people say to me, how did you start? What did you do? Well, my father said to me, when you're in Toastmasters, you're with friends. Yeah, 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 yeah. Till one day I walked in, and I'll never forget. It was February of 2001. Middle of Times Square, 14th floor of the Bank of America building. I have no idea what I'm doing, but I'm going to this meeting and I walk in and what do they all say? Hi, welcome to Toastmasters. Okay, I thought it was only the dancers that were this outgoing, but okay. <laughs> and as I sat down, Tim, the president who had this beautiful mustache, I'll never forget it. And there was Pat who had a very close cropped hair and there was Andy, tall and proud, and very strong in his speaking style and direction. I sat there and I thought, oh my gosh, I found my people. I found my people. I knew how to move my body through dance. I could talk, but Toastmasters brought it all together for me. Changed my life. It changed how I interact with my friends. It changed how I interact with my family members. It changed how I interact in my community, and it changed my career. One of the big secrets I think about Toastmasters is we're not quite making that full connection from what you do in the club to how it impacts out into the community. Would you agree? Yeah. Now, this to me really, really, really came to fruition for me when I had the opportunity to, I, I belong to a very small church remotely up in Maine. I'm there in the summer, but in, remotely in Maine. And we had gone through this whole process of hiring a new minister. And in the process of hiring the new minister, he has to present his first sermon in front of the congregation. And I'm there as the chair of the council. He's supposed to present, stay and do, finish, complete the whole thing, and then leave while we take the vote, and then he'll come back in. So Victor has this incredibly inspiring message, and everyone is like, yes, yes, yes. And then he leaves. And I'm watching him leave, and I'm thinking, wait, he didn't do the benediction. He didn't finish according to script. I turned and I said, I've always wanted to do the benediction. <laughs> <laughs> and I took my moment and thought, all right, career number four could be waiting for me. <laughs> this is the decision, the flexibility, the connection, the ability to help your members take the work that they do in Toastmasters 
and connect it directly to their lives. We've had people do things like they're practicing their best man speech. We've had people trying to practice for a project at work. We have people who are belonging to a community, sorry, a local community organization, and now they're the chair, and they have to be able to present next week to the team. So when you're trying to come up with content, I would invite you to ask your members, what are you doing in your life? And is it something that maybe you want to practice here? Maybe you're presenting at a fitness industry conference. Maybe you are going out and having to meet your whole family for the first time at a reunion and you're the MC or the host. Practice that. Practice that. Give the space for your members to practice and make that direct connection for them. Because when they go into the community, people say, wow, how did you do that? And they say, Toastmasters. <laughs> Where leaders are made. We worry, we just let me talk a little bit about the PR. You don't need the, excuse me, you need PR, but you don't need the PR if your people are going out there on your behalf. Let them be your PR. Let them go into those places in your community, in your world, in that workspace. Let them be the ones telling everybody, Toastmasters, <laughs> Toastmasters. And guess what? It's free publicity for the club. Okay? Now the biggest, for me, the biggest challenge I ever had was I, in the very beginning of Toastmasters, I was always in my club talking about fitness and let's do this and woo hoo and let's go, yeah, it's great, ha ha. And the mentor, so he said to me, I think you need to do something different. I said, okay, what? He said, well, think about it and come back. And I said, I've got it. I'll do a eulogy. <laughs> now, Obviously, she had already passed. Right, this is my mother-in-law. She had passed. However, I wanted the opportunity because I did not give the eulogy. I wanted the opportunity to do this for myself. And I remember coming in and it was, it was I knew what I was doing. I had my heart in it. I lead with my heart. I know where, that, where I come from in that. As Jocelyn said, all the emotion, especially with, with the Toastmasters group, and I even went so far as to kind of kneel down a bit and be able to do it because authentically I felt as if I was praying, giving that particular uh, eulogy. And as I started and started talking, I realized I'm walking this line. And the line is so full of emotion that I have to hold that line of, yes, you're with me and you feel my emotions, but I don't want you to worry about me. When you walk that line of emotion, you want to be able to walk that, but that your audience isn't afraid, oh my gosh, she's going to lose it. Right? You want them to be on the journey with you and come with you and be with you, but not worry if you're going to make it to the other side. That, to me, was like, it's, it's such a feeling, and I love that feeling, and I love teaching that. How do you do that? And it's vulnerability. We talked a little bit about vulnerability last night. But it's walking that line and being able to show and take the audience with you, but holding yourself together. When we talk about making that direct connection, this is what I'm referring to. Don't worry if your members don't have a speech or a topic. Or a, or a topic. Help them identify something in their workspace or in their, in their life, in their community, where they can bring all of that together. So I ask you right now, think of the people in your, in your club, in your district. What are they doing? How can you help them make that connection? OK, sidebar. So I made the point about making that connection. I told a few stories in there, a few, because I wanted to give you a couple of ideas of how these connections can happen. And I bring it back and ask you to think about, your, here's my call to action for you. Who are the people in your club, district, and how can you help make that connection? OK, does that help for those of you that are also trying to figure out how to run a, run a speech? OK. All right. 
So, yeah, oh, I'm, yes, of course. And we are going to use the microphone. And I am going to ask you to stand up. <laughs> yes. <coughs> so this is like um, uh, not as a uh, question related to leadership, but it's a personal question. So when you mentioned to maintain that fine line between putting yourself together and uh, being authentic, authentic, right? If I'm being authentic, it's hard, uh, even though, uh, so sometimes the topic might not be comfortable for me, like Jocelyn mentioned that you need to be, uh, have like, uh, uh, you need to be in a comfortable place. Mm -hmm. So how do you uh, like uh, expand your comfortable like uh, place? Because right now I'm not comfortable to share like uh, emotional stuff in add emotional stuff in my speech, even though it makes my speech more authentic, but because I'm not able to like put myself together, so how do I uh, like balance it out and expand my comfortness? Oh, that was such a great question. I actually felt you expand as you talked. <laughs> and and I, I mean that in a nice way, right? It's like, oh, how do I do this? Yes. All right, let me see if I can pull this in a little bit. And you can sit, it's fine, thank you. <laughs> You cannot be vulnerable and talk about vulnerable things if you are not comfortable. Okay? If, I, if you cannot speak about someone passing away without busting into tears in the, in the room or on Zoom, forget it. It's not therapy. Okay? <laughs> but to tiptoe into this, I would invite you to look at those things in your life that light you up. Who or what lights you up? Do you have children? Do you have a pet? Uh, maybe just hobby, some hobby. Okay. Do you have parents? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the reason I ask, the reason I ask is, I'm sure you have feelings about them. Okay. And you could maybe tell the story, I'm gonna make this up completely and we can, yeah. I'm completely making it up. But maybe you could talk about there's a certain handkerchief. I'm going to go to your grandmother because it sounds better with a handkerchief. Um, there's a certain handkerchief that your grandmother always had. And she kept on, you know, it was, it was always meaningful to her. And she always carried it in her purse, this handkerchief. And when she passed, sorry, I now have this handkerchief. And every single day, before I give a speech or before I practice, I remember the strength and the power of my grandmother by just taking this handkerchief, holding on, and delivering my message. How was that? What I'm, I guess what I'm trying to say is, the hanker, there was some emotion because I brought the grandmother in, but I'm trying to take something that's not so emotional, which is a handkerchief, and kind of tiptoe in just a little bit on that emotion and not drown in the whole thing. So tiptoe in, does that help tiptoe in? Yeah. Who's got another one? What, what lights you up, someone? What lights you up? You know, something you were just talking about I've done in the past is I tell a very emotional story, but it's not true. Oh, hold on, we have to do a microphone. I know you have a booming voice, okay. but my friends on, on Zoom will never forgive me. Okay, I was saying that you're talking about delivering emotional presentations and I've delivered emotional presentations in the past that weren't true, which means I was able to get through it because it wasn't my grandmother. Or, but I told a story about a grandmother, but it wasn't mine. But I told it as if it was mine. And so, therefore, I'm not going to get emotional through that presentation to where I would lose it because it's not really true. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do with that? <laughs> All right, Terrence, we're going to have to talk at lunch. <laughs> Because it was like, whoo, in my heart. Like, what are you talking about? But everybody thinks it's true. Oh, no, no, no. Stop right there. Stop, stop, stop. Stop, stop. Do not do what he just said. <laughs> wait a minute. Wait a minute. All right. Here, here we go. Here's his buddy standing up now. Here's his buddy. Can you, oh, we, wait. Can I do a microphone back here for just one moment? I'll come right back to you. Because this is a little follow-up over here. And I want to hear. I know he's your buddy. And he's either going to back you up or shoot you down. I'm not sure. <laughs> No, we recently lost a, a, a Toastmaster who's, who was very instrumental in District 1, in making District 1 and District 4 very successful. 
One of his teachings was always, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. <laughs> <laughs> never let the truth get in the way of a good story. But a personal story, it takes time. You have to know when you will be able to deliver that, that personal story. That I will take. You have to, that I will take. This, mm. <laughs> Let the audience decide if it's true or not. No, I don't agree. <laughs> I do not I'll agree. tell you, I'll nope. tell you, uh, but I'll, nope. okay. No, nope. I, one, one second. I, I ran into, I had a speech about meeting Muhammad Ali in an elevator. And every time I give that speech, although it is, it is true, Every word in that, it was always, the question was always, was that a, tell, a tall tale from Henry? <laughs> yeah, you guys are really throwing me off. Okay, are you, let me, let me, all right, can I wrap this up? Sure. Do not do this, <laughs> and here's why. I'm going to give all grace and respect to your friend who's passed who, about telling these stories, but yes, you, you can't make up a story unless you tell your audience, listen, I'm making this up. Right? We didn't make up stories to share with you today. You know, be like, oh, Jocelyn, she said she did a triathlon. Did she really? Oh, yeah, she did. All right. Oh, Rochelle was a dancer. Well, did she really? Well, you know, actually, it turned out I was too fat. No, I did. I did it. <laughs> Don't do that. The other part is we're in, a we're in a place now where we have to share our stories. We need to share our stories, and they have to be authentic because... We've got human beings. That's who we are. And we've been in our Zoom boxes forever. And now let's come on out. And those of you that are still in Zoom boxes, that's fine. But you've got to start sharing your stories. But don't share it unless you can hold the emotion together. And if you need to tiptoe in, work on the edges of it. Work on the edges of it. Like the handkerchief of your grandmother. It takes it puts a little more distance between it. Okay? Work on the edges of the emotion, not right jumping right in. I, I've got you, and I'm just checking to see, is there anyone on Zoom who has a piece that they want to share? Just I want to make sure I'm giving, making sure we got this covered. And go ahead. So for me, with the control, the emotional, to give um, personal speech, mm -hmm. I did give a speech about my daughter moving away from here. Mm -hmm. And I practiced and practiced and practiced. The first one, I know that if I don't practice, I will cry. So when I keep practice, when I deliver, that's helped a lot because it's not fresh anymore. But it was very um, engaging to the audience mm -hmm. because it's personal. Right. But it, I think that if you repeat it several times, that's to take that emotional. You take know. the emotion out by practicing, practicing. Goes back to Jocelyn. Practice, practice, practice. Yes. Great. Let me also share. Yeah. Hold on one second. Let me also share the practice, practice, practice. Da, da, da. Oh, I lost. It's gone. Go ahead. I. I, is this on? Nope. Try that. I agree with you about the emotion being authentic. I just remembered. Go ahead. But it is so easy to have a story. One of the speeches that I gave that I got the most acclaim for was when I told the story of a fellow Toastmaster who had to go through all kinds of turmoil in their life to get to where they want it to be. You don't have to tell your story to have an emotional story. It can be anybody else's story, and it doesn't have to be made up. Because everybody around you has stories, and those stories have emotion. Don't make something up, why? Boom, <laughs> okay, exactly, and that goes to the point of Jocelyn's story about Mark. That's another way, you can either work the edges or tell someone else's story. I saw one hand go up over here, and just gonna hold for a second while we get the mic. Would you believe that thought went out of me again? <laughs> That's terrible. That's terrible. Microphone here, and then we'll go to here next. Go ahead. Stand up, there you go, and thank you. Um, I would say in my experience with uh, when I needed to access my emotions, I had to sink deeply into my message. I had to really feel my emotions and then from there learn what they're trying to teach me, 
what they are, what truth they're unveiling and how I can carry that truth as my message and have the emotion as a driving force. But I had to first process it because when I thought I was angry, I was actually very <coughs> rageful and I didn't want, want that to come across. So right. I had to process some right. things. Yes. Right. Okay, I've had to do this, which is what my grandmother always did when she couldn't remember something and I finally remembered it. Why are you telling your story? It's not about you and it's not therapy. Why are you telling your story? And one more question and then I can pull the, oh, we've got a couple more questions, sorry guys. Just a real quick comment. No, it's okay, it's okay. Thank you, I wanna focus on your message of Speak with integrity yes. and be authentic. Yes. And I'm going to be very direct. I disagree with the two gentlemen because in the world of artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. it's so important to speak the truth. Mm -hmm. And so instead of letting the truth get, a, however you said it, don't like give it. up. Don't let, the don't let a good story get in the way of truth. Don't let the truth get in no, the way. No, no. For me. <laughs> oh, she knows what. Truth. Oh, oh, she knows what she's saying. <laughs> God, <laughs> you be quiet over there. Yeah, like, oh. woo. <laughs> the truth is more important than a good story. So do not let a good story get in the way of truth, because truth is what matters. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, hold on, hold on. We just we had to absorb that. Yes. <laughs> I got chills. That was just. <laughs> so. Okay. Yeah, it's a similar <laughs> point, but it is taken out of context. That's my uh, point here. Uh, I'm, I'm not uh, agreeing with him for sure, but <laughs> I, I would like to add to what he was trying to explain. <laughs> oh, wait, oh, wait. You're going to defend him? <laughs> I, I'm going to explain what, he's tr what, he's tr what he was trying to explain. <laughs> Don't let truth interfere in front of a great story. What does it mean? Let's say I'm talking about a truth, okay? Let's say I'm talking about the truth. A friend of mine had a, say, I'm making it this up, okay? Um, a friend, <laughs> just an example, just as an example, just as an example, okay? Yeah. A friend of mine had a problem in which she was climbing 12,647 steps. No, 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 I think it was uh, 12,400. That is the thing he was trying to point out. It doesn't matter to the audience, was it 12,000 or was it 1,999, whatever, doesn't matter. That truth is immaterial to the message I am trying to convey. So that is the point he was trying to bring up. It is still the truth, she was climbing the steps. Right. But. Was it 12,000 steps or is 1,200 steps? Does it matter? She fell down, broke her legs. That's what matters. <laughs> that is emotion. And then I build it up from there. Okay? Thank you. I tie that to my arthroscopic surgery that I had to have for my ACL. But that's how you build the story. Okay? There is truth there. But it's not an absolute truth. The hope here, the point here is to tell the story that reaches the audience, touches their hearts. That's all. All right, hold on, hold on. I gotta take the room back a little bit, all right? I don't know, I'm like, whoa! Did you all feel that room? Just kind of go, whoa! All right. all right, let me just tell you what's going on in, my, in me. All right. This is about leadership. <laughs> and you need to say, I do see your hands. I, honest to goodness, I see all your hands. But let me just pull this back a little bit. We got just a little off track. <laughs> this is about leadership and jazzed about leadership. Right? How do you add a story that will inspire leadership? Right? How do you bring information in that makes people say that, I want that? Okay. Why are you telling them a story is what I asked you before. Why would you tell them? It's not about you and feeling better instead of going to therapy. Mm -hmm. It's about your message to inspire them to leadership. One of the challenges a lot of districts have is finding the next leaders. <coughs> Who's going to fill the roles? Who's going to do them? And we stand there like, oh my gosh, what, what am I going to do? It's all, oh, I'm going to have to do everything. No, 
you don't have to do everything. There's a whole group of people waiting. They just don't know it. So asking them, I do see your hands, I promise I'll get around. Asking them, what lights you up? What are you good at and what gets you excited? So if I were to ask you, and I take a hand on this one, what do you do really well at work? Someone, what do you do really well at work? Oh, I'm extremely... Stand up and shout it out. Okay, I'm extremely detail-oriented, and a lot of people don't like that, but I oh. find mistakes. I'm de- <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so here's what I heard. She's extremely detail-oriented, and she, find, she finds mistakes. What role would she be good in in leadership in, in Toastmasters? Our con- Our <laughs> what lead? What what officer in the club would she be good at? Treasurer. Treasurer. Oh, yeah. Treasurer. What lights you up? Someone else. What do you do very well at work? I'm going to go back row. Second to the last row. Hold on. She's going to get the microphone to you. Short and concise. I want to heal. I want to hear the short and concise. Speech therapy. I remediate speech disorders. And I'm awesome at it. <laughs> She's awesome at speech disorders. What role in Toastmasters, what officer role in Toastmasters would she be very good at? VP. VP of education. All right, we got time for one more. I saw you right in there, yes. I see, I do see you. <laughs> <laughs> what lights you up? What are you really good at? I teach, and I teach math and computer science, and I'm very good with students. <laughs> what are you really good at? Explaining my stuff. Expla- Hold on one second. Let me just think. You're really good at explaining your stuff. What are you really good at? Hmm. <laughs> explaining my content to students. Okay, I can work with that. Explaining her, the content to students. What officer role would that be? Education. Membership, I would say, also, and VPPR. Do you see where I'm going? Thank you. I kept kind of moving you in a little tighter on what it was. Okay, thanks. Can I do one more? I'll do one more. Oh, wait. I've already had you. You already had the mic. Hold on. Right here. And you already had the mic, too. Is there one other person who has not had the microphone that would like to speak on what lights them up, what they're really good at? There you go. Thank you. This may not be fitting any role, probably, but I write code which doesn't have much bugs. I help write code in what? <laughs> oh, it doesn't have bugs. I write code and it doesn't have bugs. <laughs> what? Coding, yeah, 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 yeah. It's not choreography, it's coding. OK, I got it. <laughs> All right, you write code that doesn't have bugs. Is that what you said? Yeah. OK, and you're really good at it. What officer role would he be very good at? President. <laughs> Secretary? Yeah. I, I was going to say president. I was going to pop him into president. I, I, that is, I am, actually. Not. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll leave it at that one. Do you see what I'm talking about? What lights them up? What lights them up and what are they excellent at? And if someone gives me a whole paragraph, I'm like this, cut, oop, cut. Cut. It was like Jocelyn talking about taking the pieces out of a speech. Cut, 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 cut. Get me to the bottom line. What lights you up? What are you really good at? Now, I did that for you. Imagine you have a whole group, a whole team. You have a whole club, whole district, whole area. And you start asking people, hey, what lights you up? What are you really good at? If you have those listening ears, my Zoom people as well. Actually, is there anybody on Zoom that has something that lights them up? Oh, Zoom. (laughs) What lights you up? If you, you're right, the green light lights me up. (laughs) If you start listening to what people are saying, you are now in a place of leadership because you're seeing the skills of your team. They don't know it yet because they don't know the roles you're trying to fill. And we'll talk about this again this afternoon. So when I'm working with people, whether it's performance coaching or trying to work on building on the teams, it's what is that special thing that lights you up and what are you really good at? Because I want you to shine. I want you to really shine. 
So I hope that helps you understand how you can turn it and not stand there and say, there's nobody, who's gonna help me? There's nobody around for my team. No, 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 no. You gotta ask the right question. So let me just take a couple of Q and A's before I bring this to a close. Are there any questions about what I presented today in terms of this is how the story went, this is how the PSA went, point story action, this is how I can energize my club, this is how I can make the connection for them, this is how I can highlight their strengths. Any questions on any of that before I bring it to a close? Yeah, so I've been kind of uh, pondering on the word leadership and who would I accept as a leader? Uh, and it occurs to me that uh, there is some cultural connotation here in my question. But, mm -hmm. uh, depending on the context and the culture you are in, there is going to be varying a, a level of emphasis placed on the doing part when it comes to leadership, the do part as opposed to just presenting yourself or getting your ideas across or your message across. I want to know your thought about how you <coughs> round that out because I don't want to embarrass anybody, but uh, I have somebody that's sitting right next to me from my <laughs> who does enormous amount of work Although I would say she's still working on her communication and presentation skills. And to me, it's the leadership without the action would sound hollow. That's just my opinion. So I want to know your thoughts about that. I could do a whole dance on that one. Let me see. <laughs> so first of all, you brought up the cultural part of it. And I just want to address that. I mentioned this a bit last night. I am very aware of my privileges. I'm a, a thin, Caucasian, blonde woman. So when I come into a room, I, I, I know where I am, I know what I'm doing, and every one of us is important. My work in working with overweight women also gives me that opportunity to recognize each of you as individuals. I don't care about your shape, your height, your size, your weight, it doesn't matter to me. You have gifts. And I learn from you just by showing up at these, coming to these events. When it comes to the leadership, I believe, I believe, this has been my experience, that as the president, I'll say, it's our job to inspire the team, right? To kind of set the path forward. But the truth is, Toastmasters has set the path for us. We know the steps we need to take to go to get to distinguished president, to distinguished club et cetera, right? We know the steps we have to take. Toastmasters lays it all out. So as the president, the path is there. I just need to bring the team and inspire the team along. Mm -hmm. Now, let me go back for a moment to when working with people who are putting in a ginormous amount of hours. I might say to that person, you do know you're doing a lot of work, right? Is it because you want to or because you haven't figured out how to manage your time, or because you think there's no one who can help you. You have to ask the right questions as the president because this has to be fun. If you're not having fun, why are we here? So learning to delegate is one of the biggest things I think we learn in Toastmasters, right? How do we help people delegate? How do we, I'm sorry, how do you, how do you as the president delegate and ask people? It's very specific. Can you do this for me? Could you please get Rochelle water? It's down the hall in the second room to the right. Could you please bring it to her and put it on the podium? And could you please make sure she sees it? And that's all I need. And what does that person do? Boom, 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 boom. And who feels like a million bucks? Both of us. <laughs> you need to be very specific in your delegation. You need, they need to know how much time this is going to take. But your job in leadership, and I hope I'm answering your question, is to inspire your team to hold the vision and keep going. Your job in leadership as president is to also be very clear that if people are burning out, that you're seeing what's going on. If people are not feeling heard or seen, that you know what's going on. And you are there to help and support and move and adjust. Did that answer the question? Yeah, to a degree. Kind of? 
Sorry. You have. The second can't... aspect I was alluding to was many a times, uh, you know, in different culture, uh, when they hear somebody talk a lot, they sort of write them off as a salesy kind of person, as opposed to uh, l tell us what you have actually done. Uh, and that 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 was just a nuance there, but for the most part, I think uh, you addressed my question. Okay, yes. and, and I do understand. I, one of the things I'm going to talk about in the leadership, excuse me, in the team building this afternoon is addressing the the cultural issue of what's how, how do you how do you do this? I have. We have a very diverse club. Like, like Jocelyn, I have a, a community club. We are not a corporate club. We are a community club. So we are different cultures coming all together, different ages, different, yeah, all different backgrounds. So uh, addressing the cultural issue, I do hear you on that one. And you have to, as a leader, know how to address that issue. If you're talking too much, if you're being too salesy, people are going to tune out. We're there to learn. And if I'm standing there and being too salesy, I hope someone will come to me and say, hey, listen, you're too salesy. I'll be like, oh, good thing I learned that here and not, a, not the other way. Let me take care of that a little bit more. If you're around in lunch break, I'll be happy to help you. All right. So I talked about, do you remember the part where the curtain came down? And every, nearly every thread of trust within myself was broken. I'm here with you today because of that experience, moving through an eating disorder moving through alcohol because I thought that was going to fix me. And then I tried marriage. <laughs> <laughs> That's for those of you who were here last night. <laughs> None of those fixed me. It wasn't until I took the time to get super honest with myself and start to really get clear who I am, what I'm good at, and what lights me up. That gives me the absolute privilege to be here with all of you today. I think this is the greatest job in the world. The dance is still good in my heart. But being here to share with each of you and to hear your stories and to hear your questions, it's made that journey all worth the while. Today I'm able to stand here confidently with you in my red pumps <laughs> and say I trust deeply within myself. And I hope that each of you find that deep sense of trust and leadership within you. Stay jazzed about leadership because the world needs you. Thank you.